There is in every one of us a desire to return to a simpler form of living, which includes simpler ways of expressing feelings and also of acquiring knowledge. The so-called way of the gods points to it, although I do not know exactly what signification the advocates of Kaminagara no Michi want to give to this term. It seems to be certain to my mind that by this they wish to mean going back to, or retaining, or reviving the way in which the gods are supposed to have lived before the arrival of humankind. This way was one of freedom, naturalness, and spontaneity. How did we ever go astray from this? Here lies a great fundamental religious problem. Its solution gives the key to understanding some aspects of Zen Buddhism and of the Japanese love of nature. When we speak of being natural, we mean first of all being free and spontaneous in the expression of our feelings, being immediate and not premeditating in our response to environment, not making any calculation as to the effect of our doings either on others or on ourselves, and conducting ourselves in such a way as not to leave room for thought of gain, value, merit or consequence. To be natural means, therefore, to be like a child, though not necessarily with a child's intellectual simplicity or its emotional crudity. In a sense, the child is a bundle of egotistic impulses, but in its assertion of these it is altogether natural. It has no scrupulousness, no deliberation as regards practical and worldly merit or demerit. In this respect, the child is angelic, even divine. It ignores all the social devices that keep grown-ups decent and conventional and law-abiding. It is living under no such artificial human-made constraints. The practical outcome of such behavior may not always be acceptable to the taste of so-called cultivated, refined, sophisticated people of the world. But the question here is not one of such practical considerations, but of the genuineness of motive, the disinterestedness of feeling, and the immediateness of response. When there is thus no crookedness in one's heart, we may say that one is natural and childlike. In this there is something highly religious, and angels are represented sometimes as babies with wings. And this is the reason why the Zen artists have a special liking for painting Hanshan and Jitoku or Hote with a group of children. Going back to nature, therefore, does not mean going back to the natural life of primitive and prehistoric peoples. It means a life of freedom and emancipation. The one thing that hampers and complicates our modern life, especially, is the concept of teleology, which we are all made to feel in every phase of our life. The concept is all right as far as our moral, economic, intellectual and terrestrial existence is concerned, but this existence of ours means far more than all these considerations, for we never feel completely satisfied with them. We seek for something going really far deeper than the merely moral and intellectual. As long as we are on the plane of the teleological conception of existence, we are in no way free, and not being free is the cause of all the worries, all the miseries, all the conflicts that are going on in this world. To be thus free from all conditioning rules or concepts is the essence of the religious life. When we are conscious of any purpose whatever in our movements, we are not free. To be free means purposelessness, which of course does not mean licentiousness. The idea of a purpose is something the human intellect reads into certain forms of movement. When teleology enters into our life, we cease to be religious, we become moral beings. So with art. When purpose is too much in evidence in a so-called work of art, art is no longer there, it becomes a machine, or a so-called advertisement. Beauty runs away, ugly human hands become altogether too visible. Suchness in art consists in its artlessness, that is, purposelessness. In this, art approaches religion. And nature is a perfect specimen of art 
inasmuch as there is no visible purpose in the waves rolling on from the beginningless past in the Pacific Ocean, and in Mount Fuji covered with ancient snow, standing absolutely pure high against the sky. In the flower we, as beings obsessed with utilitarian ideas, may read its going to seed, and in seeds sense the harboring of a life for the coming years. But from the religious, aesthetical angle of observation, flowers as flowers are red or yellow, and leaves as leaves are green. And in this all utilitarian and teleological or biological conceptions are excluded. We admire a machine most exquisitely and most delicately balanced and most efficiently working, but we have no feeling of going toward it. It is a thing altogether distinct from us, which stands here ready to obey our commands. Not only that, we know every part of it mechanically and the purpose for which it is set to work. There is no mystery, as it were, in the whole construction of it. There are no secrets. There is no autonomous creativeness here. Everything is thoroughly explainable, subject to laws discovered by physics or dynamics or chemistry or some other science. Yet an ink sketch composed of a few strokes of the artist's brush, apparently very crudely executed, awakens in us the deepest of feelings and engages the attention of our whole being. In the same way, when we face nature, our whole being goes into it and feels every pulsation of it as if it were our own. To speak of an identification is a desecration, for it is a mechanical and logical conception which does not apply to this phase of our life. And this is where Zen Buddhism has its realm.